sign that I needed to be an Ottawa Senators fan. I'm sorry, that was not going to happen. Secondly, I did not move at the timing of the cannabis becoming legal. <laughs> Quell those two rumors right away. I, I thought about coming here way before any of this started happening. Amen? This morning, I woke up at 4.41. Uh, I, 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 my eyes got open and I looked at the clock and, uh, and I saw it was 441. In effect, 541, right? But, 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 but 441. So excited. I couldn't go back to sleep. And I tried to, but I could not go back to sleep. So excited that I will be with you today. And uh, uh, it is the anticipation uh, of my heart. I literally, uh, I, I tried to the best of my ability because of the excitement to be with you and to worship God together, I could not go uh, back to bed. And so uh, that is obviously a uh, commendation for you and the way that you have welcomed us and brought us into your family. I thought quite a bit about what are we going to do today? And uh, what are we going to focus on? And, uh, and I figured that you can't go wrong with talking about God and how great He is. Amen. Can't go wrong there. Then I thought again and said, there's nothing more right about it. The first one was safe. The second one is the way we ought to be thinking. And so as we gather for the next few months, we are going to take our eyes and focus our minds and our hearts on this great God that we serve. Amen. I was thinking about the lyrics as we were singing and, so, and those songs that we were singing. It's phenomenal. But if you're anything like me, we can sometimes just mouth the words and really not think about what we're singing. As a matter of fact, I will never remember when I was uh, first uh, coming out to church, there was a guy that we were studying the Bible with, and he, he came up to me after one church service. He says, Tony, I've got to get baptized. I said, that's, that's, a, that's a good thought. Uh, why suddenly did you uh, come to this conviction? And he said to me, he says, I can't sing those songs with deep conviction unless I realize I've surrendered my life to God. I've never heard that before, and I've scarcely heard it since. But it spoke volumes to me. And so some of those songs that talk about how great God is, and maybe it will answer a lot of questions that we have. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we take a Sunday morning and get up and take our time and come here and put on some clothes? And some of us didn't. Think about, no, I, I, always, I always have to ask my wife, honey, does this go? And she'd say, yes. And sometimes she'd look at me, what are you possibly thinking? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so among many other things, she helped me out in that area. But hopefully it'll answer some questions. Why do we do the things that we do? And I think ultimately as we understand God, and the response that we have because of what we understand He is, who He is. And it may be a little shocking this morning as we conclude about the nature of God. And so I want to say that thought-provoking thing before we go deeper into our message. And so I am very, very excited about being here. If you would turn your Bibles to Psalm Chapter 8. 
And so if we will give the focus for the next few months as I talked about what we're going to be focusing on and I prayed about it and, and uh, I really want to take some time to focus on who God is. In verse 1 in chapter 8, it says this, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. I want you to think about that for a second as we... God is not known in just merely certain parts of the earth. It's all over the earth. You know, there are some people who are stars in certain parts of the world and, and are unknown in other parts of the world. That is not our God. In verse 3 it says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? It doesn't take much to be humbled and to realize how small we are when we look at the heavens and we see the majesty of God. By the way, not in all its glory. That is only a speck of God's glory. In verse 9, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We're going to look at some verses this morning. And we're going to get our hearts and our minds prayerfully to get to catch a glimpse of how great our God truly is. Psalm 83. In Psalm 83... In verse 18, this is what it says. It says, that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Understand this. God is positioned above anybody else and everything else. He is the most high. There's no one above him. There's no hierarchy that has been created or made or even conceived that would say in their right minds, I am higher than God. I remember when there was the last eclipse that was happening and especially was going over where I was living in the United States. I remember a picture and it resonated with me is everybody who was in a massive park were looking heavenward and they looked up and one person remarked and says, but when you look up, you don't see the problems that are around you. You don't see the fighting and the challenges and, and the infighting and the racism and the prejudice and the misogyny that goes on in people's lives. When we're looking up, there's a sense of calm. And spiritually and figuratively, that's what I want to do for the next little while is that we stop and we look up and we say, our God who is the most high, who is renowned in all the earth. And we'll put things hopefully into perspective and to understand why do we do the things that we do. I am absolutely impressed by your faithfulness in spite of the challenges that we have faced over the last little while. I am inspired. It's one of the reasons that has really encouraged me to be here. 
you know, I was talking to a sister who's part of the group here. I wouldn't mention her name. But she said to me, Tony, why are you wanting to come to Ottawa? I said, why did you ask that question? She says, it's a mess here. And I said, it's why I want to come. And I understand what she was saying. But this is my family now. It's always been a distant family. Now it's a close-up family. But for the next little while, we're going to put our arms around each other and we're going to look up. And we're not going to worry about all the other things. It's going to be put into perspective when we understand the Most High and why this God is indeed so great. Psalm 96. Let's continue. Psalm 96. We read about a God who is remarkable. In verse 1, it says this. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. God is so remarkable that we ought to sing about him all the time. You know when, I remember when I was dating Melanie, 26 years ago, and there are songs that would come on the radio that became more meaningful to me. Air Supply became a group that I loved. <laughs> and songs, love songs, and I would sing at the top of my voice in my car about her, thinking about her, because she was just, I just couldn't wait to see her. When we think about our God, how much more does he deserve for us to sing about him and about all the things that he's doing? In the recent past, I sing a lot now more about with my mind and my heart. In other words, I pay a lot of attention to the lyrics that I sing. And I'll be honest with you, let me be honest with you. There are some songs that I've been to church, I could not sing. Because I didn't believe what was up there. Not because I wasn't there spiritually, and maybe that's a different thing for another time, but the things that were being said were so self-focused that I can't sing like that. that. My heart, I will be saying words that I did not feel about. And so it has become so important for me to sing not only with my heart, but also with my mind. That's another sermon for another time, but to think about. He says, sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Not only should we sing about it, we should declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. God deserves to be praised. And there are various ways that we praise. If you read the scriptures, you'll find sometimes it'll tell us to exalt the Lord. Sometimes it tells us to extol the Lord. Other times it tells us to exhort the Lord. I mean, what's the, what's the difference? I'll summarize for you real quick. When you exalt God, he, He's in a position of superiority and you're praising Him because He's that superior to who we are. Okay? When we extol God, what we're doing, we're praising Him in order to elevate Him and raise Him up because He deserves it. One is a position. One, what we're doing, the extolling, is what we are doing to say we're going to raise Him up in our minds. Okay? And then the exhort Him, that one is 
when we're doing with such joy that we're jumping around, literally, that's what it means, to jump around with such joy. And so you've got to pick maybe one, two, three, or do them all. You know, how do we praise the Lord? Do we extol Him? Do we exalt Him? Do we exhort Him? We probably need to do them all. But we've got to figure out, when we're worshiping God, what are we doing? When we're worshiping with our mind. And that's what it's important for us to understand, to praise this God. And how are we going to praise Him? And with what mind and with what heart are we going to be doing this? Praise God in all the sanctuary. Psalm 145, let's turn there. Psalm 145. This is what it says. In verse 1, I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. And as he says, no one can fathom. So wait a minute, Tony. You are going to talk about something we can't find? You're going to be talking about something we can't fathom? Isn't that futility? That doesn't make any sense. Well, we're going to talk about that in a second. The greatness of God. What makes God great? Ultimately, it's because in Chapter 150, let's go there. We'll, 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 we'll expound a little bit. We'll spend a few minutes to talk about this quality. It says in verse 2, Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Great is the Lord. What makes God so great? You know, in the book of Judges, Let's turn there. Judges chapter 13. In Judges chapter 13, we find the, the story where Samson is about to come into existence. And so we see in Judges chapter 13 and verse 17... It says this... And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. This is, of course, he was talking about um, Samson coming into being. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. That is not a great translation. As a matter of fact, the word that is used there is more correctly Translated, incomprehensible. And so, for the next few weeks, we're going to search for the unsearchable. We're going to try to comprehend the in incomprehensible. We're going to try to compare the incomparable. We're going to try to describe the indescribable. These are words that actually talk about who God is want to quote some of our great historians when it comes to who God is. This is what Tozer said. If God can be understood and comprehended by any of our human means, then I cannot worship Him. Augustine says, We are speaking of God is it any wonder that you do not comprehend? For if you comprehended him, he cannot be God. Let us be a pious confession of great ignorance rather than a rash profession of knowledge. To have a very slight knowledge of God, it is a great blessing. To comprehend him is altogether impossible. I love what Stephen Charnock says, it is visible that God is. It is invisible what he is. Let me say that again. 
It is visible that God is. It is invisible what He is. I got I to gotta share a couple more with you that, that fired me up when I, when I read this. Tozer also said, our concepts of measurement embrace mountains and men, atoms and stars, gravity, energy, numbers, speed, but never God. We cannot speak of measure or amount of size or weight and at the same time be speaking of God. For these tell of degrees and there are no degrees of God. All that He is, He is without growth or addition or development. I love to get my mind to be stirred when it comes to my relationship with God. So many times people talk about their Christianity or their relationship with God and people accuse Christians of being simple-minded and, uh, and, and not thinking much about it. I don't want that accusation about me to be true. But for us to have reasons and to think about why we are going to try to comprehend the incomprehensible. I love this one as well. In theology, there is no O, as in O-H. And this is a significant, if not an ominous thing. Theology seeks to reduce what may be known of God to intellectual terms. And as long as the intellect can comprehend, it can find words to express itself. And by the way, I'm not down on theology at all. As a matter of fact, the more we can learn, the better it is. That's awesome. But when God himself appears before the mind, awesome, vast, and incomprehensible, then the mind sinks into silence and the heart cries out, Oh, Lord God. Think about all the things. Spurgeon says, Nothing will so enlarge the intellect Nothing so magnify the whole soul of a man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the great subject of the deity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can comprehend and grapple with them, in them we will find a kind of self-content and go on our way with the thought, Behold, I am wise. But when we come to this master science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. See, the idea of what we're going to be doing is to look at this incomprehensible God and try and comprehend some part of it. One man says, we can know God, but we can't comprehend Him. So what is this all about? The idea of the incomprehensibility of God ought to lead us to humility, awe, and reverence, not a sense of dejection or what's the use and desist from seeking our God. That's the kind of Christians we ought to be. That we're seeking this God and we're not ashamed and we're not scared when science only confirms who our God is. And even if we can't understand it, it's not a cop-out to say, I simply don't understand Him. And I'm here to tell you today that the God that we worship and the God that we give honor and praise to, cannot be confined on pages in a book. Oh, we will understand some things about God through His Word, and we ought to read it and study it and pray about it. 
But it is not by any stretch of the imagination exhaustive. That's the God that we worship. And I can tell you as I reflected in the 32nd year as a Christian, I am more in awe and I know less about God I realize than I ever have. But I thought, Tony, as you grow in the Lord, you're supposed to know more. No, I know less. That doesn't deject me. It inspires me to search more. What God do you think about in the morning or throughout the day? Is our God a cosmic bellhop that when I need him, I ring that bell, and if he doesn't answer my prayer, I, we say he's not with me and he doesn't love me? Or is it like when Job was going through the struggles as he did? And in the end he says, what am I and who am I? As we investigate for the next little while about who this great incomprehensible God is, prayerfully we will have an understanding of why do we do the things that we do? Why do we get up and why, why does someone come here and set up the chairs? And we don't understand, like some of us, it's like, wow, there are people who came here this morning, set up these chairs, they're not here. And somebody comes and they're rushing to church and their car breaks down like Alex's car this morning. And somebody else jumps to fill in, why? Or we sing, the so we sing the songs that we do. Or give our money to something. But why do we do it? Or we move the clothes that we wear and the attitude that we have. And why do we have the purpose that we have? It's not some artificially created things. But that our motivation will be crystallized when we understand how great our God is and how much he's worth our time, our energies, our all. We don't give glory and honor to, and praise to God because he needs it. There's no addition we can give to God. Nothing. Nothing that we give to him that adds to who he is. Let me say that again. There is nothing that we can give to God that adds to who he is. Think about that. You give to me $5, I'm $5 richer. <laughs> I hope it was 10 but that's another discussion for another time. You give to me some food, I will be less hungry. Depends how much you give me, then I will be probably totally full. You add to what you give me. To God. God doesn't our praise of God and our honor and glory of God, it's not because he needs it. It's because we respond to such a great God with only exaltation, exhortation, and exhalation. That's our God. And I'm not ashamed to say it. And so when we sing, you visit with us, man. Some of us, we look up, and some of us, we raise our hands, and some of us are embarrassed to raise our hands, and I don't know where we are on that thing. Some of us might jump up. Why? Because he deserves it. But I don't understand all of it. It's okay. That's who our God is. And I tell you, as we... I don't have time to talk about everything. That's what we're going to do a series. Amen? Amen? But you know what? As we think about the idea how God is incomprehensible, it would be true to say that today we have more knowledge of God than we ever had. I believe we have more, theologically speaking, 
We know more about God than any other generation has ever known. There are more books about God. There are more books on the secrets of the Christian life. There are more resources, tapes, records, libraries, churches, missionary organizations in this world than there has ever been. But do we comprehend God more? We know more about God, but do we know more? Do we know Him even more? It's a question that we've got to ask ourselves. We have books in the Holy Spirit, books on God the Father, books on Lord Jesus Christ, books without number. The writing on, of them goes on. We have, as the great prophet said, we have books on the baptism of the Spirit. We have books on baptism of the Spirit. We have books on tongues. We have books how not to speak in tongues in, in how to find fulfillment. We have books on everything. We have knowledge about everything. Indeed, evangelistic Christianity today, it could be said has all the answers. And indeed, the answers that all want you can get them no matter what your view is. You can get knowledge upon it. We know the gospel inside out. Indeed, even the unregenerate know the gospel inside out. We know the Lord Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He was incarnate. He was the word of God. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The lamb of God coming to take away the sin of the world. We know that he rose from the dead. We know he showed himself among the apostles. We know he ascended to heaven. And when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. We know about his second coming. We know all these things. When the King James Version was printed, they had five manuscripts. Today, these new translations have 1,500 manuscripts. Our translation, our ability to get more accurately what the scripture says is unbelievable. Today, it's not these things. Whether or not we know about God is whether or not we can comprehend Him. And the truth is, it is more exciting. Prayerfully, you will enjoy the ride in the next couple of months as we get to know this guy. And then at the end of it, we're going to fall down in humility and reverence and awe and say, he deserves him. And then when we come, like this morning, I know it was my first service. I couldn't go back to bed. <laughs> Unfortunately, guys, there are times when I come to church and I could, when I think about church service, I could easily go back to bed. I wasn't fired up because my mind and who my God is and what I'm trying to do and why I'm doing it, what I am doing, is not where it needed to be. And then people, idiosyncrasies are not going to bother us that much. I don't like the way she dresses. I don't like her hair. I certainly don't like his ears. <laughs> It's amazing. The same set of people that we can totally love all the things and they say, ah, he's just like that. I mean, that's just, that's his way. And the other person does the same thing and it irritates the tar out of us. <gasps> What's up with that? I want to realize, man, we got our eyes focused on the wrong things. And so, as we enter the next few weeks to talk about how great our God is, today, hopefully you got a glimpse that He's incomprehensible. Tony, why did you waste my time this morning to tell me ultimately we can't understand God? <laughs> I mean, can you really understand? Can you really, if you have a child... Can you really understand that you're going to send your child to die for some people who some would not even respond? <laughs> is, it, is it even... No, no. My child gets sick and I'm worried. You want me to come visit you? What can I do to help? My, my goal is not to go. Sacrifice yourself. It is incomprehensible that you would offer and give your son to someone 
who would not add anything to your life. We give to those that somebody somewhere, they may give back some to me and we're going to have some mutually beneficial relationship. There is nothing mutually beneficial that God has with us in our relationship. It's purely on our side, holy and absolutely so. We get all the benefits. That doesn't make sense. But we just say, thank you, God. Thank you. And so as we take the communion, this morning, if we can get the ushers to be ready, I want you to think about how great this God is and yeah, how, he done the, how he's done the incomprehensible to say, I love you. And today I hope that you are now are going to, I mean, in today's generation, we have no excuse to find out all that we need. I mean, it's at our fingertips. You want to search more about this kind of stuff? Delve. Search. There are places that you can go for free. (laughs) My role is not to feed you so that you're filled until next week. I know sometimes we pray that God, I pray that this, what we learned today is going to ha- be great for us. To, no, no. It's to get you to think so that you can examine your life in light of who God is. And hopefully, I'll give thought provoking th- uh, sermons, I will stir your hearts and your minds. And yet, this morning, we got a glimpse of the incomprehensible nature of our Father when He sent His Son to die for our sins. Let us give thanks for the body and blood of Christ that we have this opportunity to approach His grace, with conf- His, His, uh, His throne with confidence, not because of anything we have done, but because of what He has done. Let us pray. God, we're so grateful that Your Son died for our sins. Father, there are times we don't understand that. There are times when we shake our fists at you and we do things that we know that are wrong and we can't help ourselves and yet you love us so much. I don't get it, God, but I thank you for it. And I pray that this morning that we reflect on how great you are, Father, in sending your one and only Son. And Jesus, we thank you for your death because it meant life for us and it offered us salvation that we can approach your grace with confidence, not because of anything we have done, but because what you have done. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.